visitor. I'm the alien in the, uh, in, the, in the listing here, and I'm coming from the application space. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how to, uh, one way possibly to think about building a bridge. One of the earlier speakers said, big data is about you know, getting everything from people. You know, he called it chaff, I guess. Uh, and then reflecting it back is a challenging problem and something application programmers need to do. How can we possibly reflect what information lies in our big data sets back at the scale of the user, not just at the scale of the analyst. So as application programmers, we like to use the term database, and I think we all know what that is. At a minimum, we think it's a reliable place to keep our data, right? We put stuff there, and it's, it sticks. And uh, that's an insufficient definition, right? We have file systems that we don't call databases and, and various other things. But we're starting to call a lot of things that um, are merely this databases, and I think they're missing something that we really prize in databases, especially at the application level, and that is leverage. Right? When we use traditional databases, we have leverage. The leverage comes from the fact that the database organizes the data. It actually is aware of what it is. It's not just blobs of stuff and files that it doesn't understand. And then finally, a database will expose to us some sort of higher-level logic we can use to manipulate it. Now, of course, we know we can take logics and apply them to unstructured data, um, but the fact that the storage organization supports logic is what allows this to happen quickly. The last thing a database does for us, well, one of the many other things a database will do for us is coordination. It's less of interest possibly to this crowd, but it's a big interest to applications. So we know what traditional databases look like. They're these boxes. They do all kinds of stuff. Right? They do transaction processing, they index the results of transactions, they process queries, they handle res um, requests from users, and they manage storage. And we know that this is a monolithic system, and it's difficult to scale, right? What are your, what are your choices here? You can either take this box and inflate it, try to make one box bigger, and that will obviously burst like a balloon at some point, or you can take this box and you can replicate it. You can make a lot of copies of this box. But this box is a complex thing. And if you make a lot of copies of it, you end up with a lot of complex things, which is not what you want. So that's why we don't use these kinds of databases for big data. Right now we have the modern database. And the modern database looks like this to an application programmer. Right? It looks like storage. There's almost no leverage. There's certainly no leverage at the speed of application programs. Um, so what happened? How do I get it back? And what I want to encourage you to do today is just think about um, using the big storage tools, which are great. You know, Hadoop, these large distributed redundant key value stores are powerful tools as components in a solution that can reach back up towards the application space. So what we need to do is revisit the tasks of traditional database uh, took on in the context of a suite, an ensemble of components working together. So indexing, right, is a critical component. And indexing is just a function of storage to storage. It takes storage that's not organized and makes it into storage that's organized. You can do indexing, you know, from Hadoop to Hadoop or from Hadoop into a, a distributed key value store. You're not talking about necessarily leaving the large distributed space, um, but you're talking about making a transformation from unordered to ordered. While you're doing this, obviously, you have great opportunities to just call out information that's valuable. You have uh, you know, uh, the ability to slice things. Um, this is quite important because most of your data sets you, you can't afford a second copy of. Right? But the most important thing here is the fact that this will let you leverage the power of logarithmic access. Okay? Linear time access on a 1,000 machines Guess what? It's still linear time access. The math is against you. You are never going to serve user scale with a divisor. I don't care how, many, how big the divisor is, how many boxes you put under. You can serve data scientists. You cannot serve users. You need the power of the logarithm, which means you have to organize your stuff. Once you've done that, you get another component. That's query. All query engines need is something that's organized. They all just need the minimum amount of organization. And this can take a lot of forms. This can be distributed. That's not a problem. And once you've got organized information, you can support completely different paradigms for querying it, right? End users don't probably need to aggregate everything that you know. They need to ask specific questions, maybe about things related to them. 
but you can get different flavors. The other thing you can get by building things out of components that's breaking away from the monolith is the fact that a single query process or a single question can tap into multiple independent sources because they're not silos that co-locate um, query and, and information. Now, of course, what ends up happening in a, in a situation like this is in addition to the models, you end up with independent pools of locality of reference. Because right? it's the same thing. If you shard physically underneath, you can support one kind of approach to finding stuff. But what's going to happen is you're going to want to have many approaches, and you're actually going to want to shard over, right, and get organizations with locality of reference depending on the kinds of problems that you solve. Not every question needs to look at every piece of data. Coordination, again, it's probably not that important to people in this room, but it may be important to people that you work with. And the point I want to make here is just once you've broken away from a monolithic approach to databases, transaction coordination is an a la carte thing. You can get data into storage through batch processing or through parallel um, you know, eventual consistent writes or through transactions. It's just a coordination option. Um, but when you need it, you really do need it. And it's nice to have a story that allows you to connect these things together. The most important takeaway from this, though, is we looked at this whole picture for query and everything else. It had completely independent scaling characteristics from transaction processing. The biggest benefit you get from breaking out of a monolithic approach is the fact that read scaling and write scaling are orthogonal things you can make independent decisions about. And there are lots of other things that you might uh, choose to incorporate in this idea of sort of building a database uh, for application use out of components. In particular, that indexing job I talked about is something that's going to be sort of batch-oriented and happen periodically. So to fill that gap, you might want to build systems that uh, provide notifications of recent change, build in-memory indexes of live um, to fill the gap between the static view and the live view. And caching is another thing we already treat as a component, right? You can just take memcache off the shelf and build a system by connecting it to other things. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about here, the kind of approach you can take to these other, uh, to building the system. So what I would encourage you to do is to take your storage, take this very powerful technology, that's distributable, and consider it not you know, the end game, but the beginning of an approach to reaching uh, users by building up the leverage that we're used to having with databases without taking on the, the problems associated with a monolithic approach and uh, get your leverage back. Thanks. <laughs>